everybody. Thank you for waiting. Uh, some logistic issue, but we're here. So this is one of the first webinars that uh, we are doing with the Cultic Alliance. Uh, at the Cultic Alliance, we are uh, um, a non-for-profit organization that operates to expand the security knowledge of uh, everybody in the cloud. We do conference, webinar, meetups, and so on. And this meetup today is uh, bringing you Dimitri Yates to have an interesting conversation with him and us and having a very um, interesting background on some of the cloud transformation. And I hope this is informative for everybody. So the talk, I'm gonna introduce the talk and then Dimitri is gonna um, walk you through uh, the cloud security transformation challenges. And then we're gonna have a small panel in q and I'll please invite everybody to go to the Cloud Security Alliance UK chapter, that is www.cloudsecurityalliance.org.uk. We do, we have a number of blog posts, research paper, uh, and as I said, we do events. So we participate in a number of events uh, and we have our own annual gateway meeting, uh, also known as AGM. Um, it has a completely separate page. I'm gonna share it uh, at the end. So who is the Cloud Security Alliance? Um, Lee, Paul, Lewis, Chris, Ben, Ron Lee, Dimitris, Vladimir, this is the board, but we are uh, a much wider organization. These are the leader that leads the UK chapter, but we are a wi much wider organization. We are with 300 members strong at this point in time uh, and 1,200 uh, across the UK and uh, Ireland. So, I'm going to stop talking despite the fact that I'm Italian and I love to talk and I'm going to give my uh, the presenter right to Dimitri. Dimitri, presenter is yours. Um, and yes, thank you for taking your time out in this sort of difficult time to uh, join us here today. Um, I just really wanted to uh, basically talk everyone through something which we have been discussing um, among the board members and the rest of um, the CSA here, UK chapter, and it's really about how we can add uh, practical value, uh, giving something to uh, the audience here today um, that actually is not just death by PowerPoint, but actually something that's really practical and useful. So what I wanted to talk to everyone about today is some uh, learnings which I personally have had and got working through some very, very large cloud transformations across various industry sectors and very, very large companies. And so this is what that's what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, a little bit about me. Can everyone see my slides? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so a little bit about me. I've been in technology for a long time, well over two decades. I'm a self-confessed uh, sort of tech technophile and lover of all things technology. I have been involved in very large cloud transformations for the best just over a decade now. And so I've seen a lot of things, um, a lot of different transformations, um, some successful, some not so much. And really, I think what I wanted to talk about today was the reasons, uh, as, as I saw it, for certainly the uh, more successful transformations and why they were more successful than others. Um, slight disclaimer, of course, everything I speak about today is obviously from the trenches and sort of real life experiences. However, I have tried to keep it as generic as possible. So I'm not referring to any particular client or organization, but rather more about the learnings. Right, so I think we all are aware of the, um, the value um, uh, in terms of 
why people do digital transformations. And I think it's fair to say when we mention or use the words digital transformations, we are using or talking about um, uh, moving into the cloud, be that a completely uh, private uh, public model or a hybrid of public, private, on-prem and a combination of cloud vendors. So obviously, uh, when we talk about cloud, um, you know, sort of is there's a synergy with that and digital transformation. Also, I don't want to talk too much here about the uh, accepted, widely accepted values of cloud computing, such as agility, flexibility, scale, all of those things. <clears throat> you know, I think it is almost agreed universally that those those things are there. Um, so I think I I won't don't want to go too much into that. And this is not a technical talk. Um, we can certainly have a technical conversation should we wish to have to have one in the future. Um, but this is more around the sort of, if you like, the, the people side of things. And in my uh, arguably perhaps the, the, the real core issue and the real problem I have found certainly when people move into cloud. So with that, uh, just moving on to the next slide here. Um, bear with me a second. The joys of working from home. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think we've all been involved and seen um, cloud transformations and migrations to the cloud have perhaps taken a bit longer than they should have cost quite a bit more than they should have and I think more importantly did not deliver uh, the vision or the value or should we say the expectations uh, at the start of them for whatever reason and I think for me one thing I have noticed is um, a lot of the challenges that uh, people uh, have faced or organizations have faced when it comes to successful migration haven't been uh, necessarily technical. Technical issues can be solved. But I think the biggest challenges, as I mentioned at the top when I opened up this conversation, was the more successful uh, migrations I've been involved in, certainly taking into account these three key factors. And these are the three factors I want to talk to you about today. Um, so we can all see. So one of the biggest ones is obviously uh, as organizations go into the cloud, um, a lot of organizations do not consider the impact of uh, that change, that transformation to the political climate and the organizational structure. Uh, a second problem or challenge uh, or consideration, which a lot of uh, my clients uh, certainly uh, certainly successful ones, uh, took, took into account was preparing for the necessary changes to the organization's processes, you know, its culture, the ways of working. And finally, there's also um, the requirement, which may sound obvious, um, but it's the way you plan for it, is the upskilling, uh, training, and the employee communication. So things like setting up a cloud center of excellence and things like that. So I want to talk very, very briefly about each one of these in turn. Um, and these are non-technical issues which very often overlooked by senior management because they're seen as a cloud transformation, seen as a purely a technical domain. So when we use digital transformation or cloud migration, people think about it as a technical issue. Um, but certainly there's a very, very uh, non-technical side to the cloud migration coin, um, and that's what we're going to talk about. So clear and decisive leadership. So one of the things I have found and seen in successful migrations, and certainly in the unsuccessful ones, is clear and decisive leadership. What does that mean? So the actual uh, decision makers, the leadership of the company needs to make it very clear throughout the entire company that this is the direction of travel. And direction of travel means that everything is going to be cloud first as a first or default position. Obviously, things can change. Um, obviously, there are challenges, but that message needs to be clear that cloud is a direction of travel. And you know that's the way it's going to be. That message should come from the very top. It must be very clear. It must be emphatic. 
Um, and basically, I think another thing which which um, organizations sometimes fail to do is to change, uh, make changes and plans that would uh, be required in order for that message to be enacted, if you like. Um, so I'll give I'll give an example of um, what we mean by the changes. Uh, so if if we were to look at procurement as a simple example, so um, procurement is a is a division which in traditional IT environments, and not just traditional IT environments, but I would say companies as a whole, historically, we all have and worked with procurement departments. Um, procurement departments exist for very good reason. They generally have very good relationships with vendors, suppliers, clients, etc. And this is one particular area, you know, this, this, depending on the size of the company, the, this can be quite a large uh, or set of people or, or division, or maybe not so much so. But if we were to take any average size company, you certainly have at least a handful of people working in procurement. And as and when a company moves into the cloud, the question becomes is how relevant is procurement? So we all know if you want to provision something in the cloud, um, it's literally a matter of you know clicking a button and you essentially get a bill at the end of the month. So there's no sort of long-winded processes of ordering, uh, contract negotiation, et cetera, et cetera. So how does this actually impact a company moving into the cloud? Um, and one of the things that people worry about quite naturally, and this is where the sort of non-technical aspect is, um, people do worry um, and worry about their jobs quite basically, quite frankly. They worry about their jobs. So if we're going back to my example of procurement, I think the communication aspect then becomes very relevant. So um, again, if I can go back to my three sort of uh, three key factors, um, one of which um, um, I mentioned was clear message from leadership. And here clear, clear leadership means decisions, hard decisions need to be made made about what? So take the procurement uh, division as, as the example again. Uh, obviously, people will be wondering, well, am I actually required or needed in this company going forward? Um, will I have a job You know, by the time this cloud migration completes? And this is where hard decisions need to be made. Again, clear leadership. So the uh, leadership of the successful companies have would have or sometimes make plans. Um, they adjust the size or the number of employees, um, procurement just being an example, and you know making hard decisions of either moving people on or moving them to another department. And essentially, at the end of that, what they do is they make it very clear to the people that they are going to keep on, that they will be kept on, that they will be trained, um, and they will be upskill as necessary. But here's another thing. So again, if you look at the example of procurement, these people generally tend to have very good relationships, have build, built relationships over the years with finance. They have built relationships with various departments within an organization. And these relationships and skills actually come in very, very useful in the cloud. So I'll give an example. So if you migrate into you know, a cloud um, vendor, <coughs> AWS, Azure, whichever, and you essentially have built all your infrastructure, your architecture, you have an understanding or instances you want to run, et cetera, et cetera. That's great. And now every month you literally have a bill. So assuming that you've done your tags or some other identifier of identifying what department or division within an organization you use, is using what cloud resources, that relationship that's already there with uh, procurement and the rest of the organization actually help in that they will actually be able to communicate with the right person in department X or department Y and say, look, here's your bill for, you know, the previous month. Um, is it too big? Is it too large? Someone might want to, I don't know, adjust that, 
you know, maybe increase it, reduce it. And those relationships absolutely come in very, very handy indeed. So again, even though you are uh, transitioning or migrating to the cloud, um, if you've actually communicated to procurement, these people know that their jobs are, are valid and they're secure, they actually, you know, start to enjoy their job and they actually add a lot of value to that entire migration process, if you like. Um, another example of uh, the challenge, a human challenge, when it comes to um, migrating into the cloud is I certainly recall um, <laughs> many, many discussions and conversations with technical people. So an example of that is, uh, it was the message was sort of clear that you know, some cloud instances were going to be used. And I've had conversations as an architect uh, with other architects, certainly IT, um, along the lines of, okay, here's what we need to migrate. L here's how we can do it. Let's go ahead and do it. And you get a lot of um, <laughs> roadblocks. So for example, I have heard conversations and had interesting conversations along the lines of, oh, we can do better resilience and better backup. Uh, on-premise or um, things like Cloud Foundry. Those of us who don't know what Cloud Foundry is, I'm sure most of us do, but um, Cloud Foundry, so we have an on-premise cloud-like instance. It's much better. It's much more scalable. It's much more agile. All those arguments come in. And you have these conversations and essentially people either slow the whole process down or find a ton of different arguments to, to, to stop or prevent things happening. You end up having meetings about meetings. You end up having a lot of uh, challenges and very robust conversations about why this won't work and that won't work, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially, this goes back to the idea that generally people don't like change but also people are generally worried for their jobs. You also have IT people who have spent a lot of time, a lot of maybe, maybe years, you know, building a server somewhere, uh, invested time and effort to get it running in a particular way. So um, I think when I started doing cloud migrations, I think well over about six years ago now, I remember I was involved in a really large project and I had, all these challenges and we wasted a lot of time and effort just trying to sort of convince if you like the IT department that the cloud was better in doing this or that and you know the light should have been obvious <laughs> but the light came on I recall I had a conversation in a pub with one of the IT guys and he literally said to me yep yeah, Dimitri I've been hearing your arguments for a long time now you know you're probably right I think you're right but I'll be honest with you, I'm just scared that I'll lose my job. I don't know what will happen. We, none of us know what will happen. And so, yeah, we, we just, you know, we're just not comfortable. And that, that's fine. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's just another example of things that do happen. Um, you know, you, you also get the arguments of we've always done things this way. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and all these sort of arguments go back to ultimately it's fear fear of people not knowing what the what the future brings for them and their jobs in that company so with all that said um it's obviously good well and good to talk about the problems um the real issue is what can you do to fix it so the first thing which people, uh, an organization, a senior leadership uh, needs to do is communicate very clearly with their employees. So by that, I mean, once hard decisions have been made and some hard decisions will have to be made, unfortunately, that's the nature of the beast. It's also part of the cost savings of moving into the cloud. As you automate, you have a leaner, perhaps meaner IT organization. Maybe you can still keep the size, but things will have to change and hard decisions will need to be made. Those decisions uh, aren't and shouldn't be made by the security architect or the solution architect. Those are decisions much higher up at the board level, uh, which whatever the organization's structure is. But those are hard senior leadership decisions. Once those decisions are made, they should then be communicated all levels in that organization. You have to have a planned communication approach, depending on how large that 
company or organization is, you might want to consider bringing in professional communication companies to tailor your message the right way. But that message must be constant, it must be regular, and it must be ongoing. Um, and I think a key part of that message, um, and that should have filtered down to individual, if you like, managers, division leaders, directors, etc. It's that people's minds should be put at rest. Say, okay, you know, your job might change. Uh, we're going to train you. Um, you are still valued. You are going to be needed. Um, and you certainly have a part to play in all this. It's really, really important that that message comes through. <clears throat> Otherwise, you know, you will have some serious, serious challenges in getting uh, any cloud migration or digital transformation project over the line. Um, as part of the communication, I think, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of negatives, but there's one really interesting positive that's come out of successful migrations I've been in. And it is around the way of working, certainly within IT. So a very good example is if you take your development team or your um, uh, whatever team writes, adjusts or manipulates your coding organization, they definitely um, add a lot of, oh, I wouldn't say add, there is certainly a lot of value and benefits um, from going into the cloud. And I'll explain what, what I mean by that. So I've seen many um, development, software development teams and small organizations, large organizations have become really enthused about doing their jobs. They certainly had, uh, you know, I've seen software development teams that had high turnover rates. Suddenly, you know, that turnover rate stopped. Um, once they bought into the cloud, um, I've seen developers come with the tons of ideas. Um, they've obviously improved, uh, you know, productivity, etc. And that's not just down to obviously the automation of a CI/CD pipeline, etc. But it is more when you look into it, and we looked into it, and we spoke to these developers, and we spoke to you know managers and the actual coders themselves. It's okay. What is it you know that you find? Uh, a so invigorating in this new sort of cloud world and what they say to you is you know it's the speed at which they can actually um, if you like have an idea in their head put that into a concept and roll it out into development and pre-prod right things which the cloud obviously enables them to do so um, where before you had a whole waterfall model and it takes months or weeks to provision a test server I think we all know the, uh, the, the the gig we all know the issues suddenly in the cloud you know they have an idea they're certainly enthused and they're certainly working they can spin up what they want to do much faster they can put into development and test and they can collaborate and they can work and this is actually a huge added value to an organization so again um, I think what I wanted to point out here is not just the three uh, key things to think about as you migrate, but also bear in mind that there are, obviously, aside from the obvious uh, migration, cloud migration, the CapEx to, to OpEx model, all those things, there's actually an added people value as well. So people actually start to enjoy working and you get an added productivity boost, which some organizations weren't expecting when they certainly were at the start of their journeys into the cloud. So again, um, just to recap, I think there are um, three core things um, which I wanted to bring out, if nothing else, to the audience today. Um, the three things to consider into as we move into the cloud, certainly with the current climate, um, COVID-19, etc. A lot of us, um, or most of us, or all of us, uh, almost are working from home. We are using um, the cloud a lot more. Um, I think and I predict that ways of working will probably certainly be looked at again and um, reconsidered, refactored as we go forward. And so cloud transformations will not certainly um, just remain the same. I think possibly we might be looking at increase 
once this is all over. And so the three things which I think we all need to bear in mind again is A, the impact of changes to political climate and organization structure as you move into the cloud. Um, also to um, preparing for necessary changes, organization behavior, the culture, and ways of working. And finally, and you know, last but not the least, upskilling and training your staff uh, and, and employees to be ready um, as, as they embark on this journey. So with that, I think that's um, all I wanted to say today. Um, obviously, I know we are running a bit behind time, so I've had to uh, shorten my um, <laughs> speech or ramble. Oh, I wouldn't call it a ramble, but my speech certainly. Um, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Um, really, really appreciate having you all here. And one more thing I wanted to point out there is actually a corresponding white paper for this talk, which you all can download. Um, and sort of help you to sort of recall and remember um, the key points, the key learnings, which uh, certainly I've taken and got from my cloud migration experience in the industry. With that, I hand over to Lewis and thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, Dimitri, thank you very much. You need to unshare so that I can share, please. Absolutely. And. Um, Thanks everyone again for joining and to uh, Dimitri for what I thought was a, a very clear uh, explanation of the issues around uh, spinning up a cloud and getting an organizational acceptance of that cloud. I've certainly got one question I'd like to ask on behalf of the board, but before I do, if anybody else uh, listening has a question they'd like to ask Dimitri, uh, perhaps you could uh, you could go ahead and ask. Don't forget to unmute, or you can use the chat facility at the bottom of the screen somewhere to uh, to send him a chat direct. And Dimitri, feel free to chip in. So, just quickly, what we've got uh, today is, uh, as well as Dimitri and myself, I'm the director of research for uh, CSA UK. Uh, we've got Vladimir, who's director of events, uh, Sean. And I think, I'm not sure if Francesco is still on the phone, um, but uh, Francesco as well. Yep. So we're all geared up to ask questions, but let, let, me just, um, let me just ask, has anybody else got a question from the, uh, from the floor, as it were, to ask Dimitri before we go ahead? I think it's, it's best if we use the chat and Paul have asked um, a question that we can uh, we can answer. Okay, so you know, question number one: What steps should organisations take to prepare themselves to move to the cloud, and why? And I think Dimitri, you've addressed some of that, but do you just want to elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, <clears throat> um, I think one of the things I. I didn't mention um, in my uh, talk was when it comes to steps uh, organizations prepare again um, I, take the technical designs or you know the migration designs all those technical things aside which for me personally I think are the easiest bit to, to fix it's about considering the uh, impact again on the if you like the the people the people aspects of your organization the politics even so this is another word sort of the unspoken word maybe not the nice word but politics so you know people naturally like don't like to lose control they don't like to lose their spheres of influence they don't like to have a smaller team you know all these issues come into play and um, obviously fear of losing their jobs um, and so what should organizations do to prepare for themselves for that? Well, they need to plan. They need to factor that into their thinking, right? So um, factor, have a conversation with a director of IT and say you might actually have a smaller team going forward now, um, you know, less headcount. However, you know, we might increase budget to do this or that. So you need to have those conversations, difficult conversations. You certainly need to communicate to your employees and staff um, that you will be keeping on 
that their jobs are safe and that they will be upskilled. Um, mm. A lot of people are very happy to learn new skills, not only because they keep their jobs, but also it makes themselves more marketable. So communication, planning for the people effect is what, for me, uh, one of the things that gets missed a key thing that gets missed and um, it certainly slows down migrations and has a huge impact because people t tend to think just of the technical issues and having fun with all these new services and i certainly am one of them but you know if this bit gets missed then you have a, a problem yeah i i agree and i think your point about upskilling is is very important my experience of cloud migrations uh, is very much one that uh, it, it tends to require a different kind of workforce, not necessarily different people, but a, a workforce with a different set of skills. And very often those skills need to be not just technical, but, um, you know, communication skills, as in reaching out to outside organizations like Amazon or Google or whoever, um, and which raises an interesting point that I've never thought about, that the procurement are very used to doing that kind of thing. Indeed. And, and so there's a good, you know, intercept there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely, Lewis. And again, just going back to, <clears throat> sorry, my talk. So the skills and the relationships that uh, procurement have acquired over the years certainly um, adds a huge amount of value in, this, in these sort of situations. Absolutely. If, if and not I'm just right, with, ex um, sorry. If, if, sorry, mate. No, uh, no, I was just on. saying not just externally as well, but internally as well. So remember, as you go into the cloud, you suddenly get bills, sometimes very large bills. And you say, how do you allocate to what department, that sort of thing. So that's where the relationships that uh, procurement would have built and developed with various departments actually comes into play. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. I, I mean, on, on that note, like, I think it's important to understand what your current costs are. So to take your take your capex current capex bills, your, what you were what you were spending, what your replacement costs were. Look at the life cycle life cycle like uh, expend, expected sort of life cycle of the equipment, uh, which differs as well for <clears throat> it will be very different for network equipment and then sort of active equipment storage and stuff. So storage probably has the shortest lifespan of anything in a data center and network equipment probably has the longest or rather yeah. passive network has the longest and active network has sort of the second longest. Yeah. Uh, but then there's network associated with storage and stuff like that. So there, there's lots of nuances and some of these fit line items are quite big and they all have different kind of lifespans. And then you, you've, you're then trying to optimize, A, knowing what the equivalent versions of these things are in the cloud uh, and what they cost. Uh, and what, exi what, you know, what options there are to, to replace like for like and or change your services, re refactor your services so they're, so they're better suited to the cloud in the first place, which is a very important and far too big for this presentation kind of topic. Well, that's your next topic of presentation, yeah. <laughs> Sean, thanks. Um, Probably. Sean, Sean, would you just like to introduce yourself quickly? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I'm uh, DevOps lead at uh, Kraken Digital Asset Exchange. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just just to expand on that ever so slightly. So then, you're trying to optimize a for like for like costs, capex versus opex, uh, and take the people thing into account as well. Uh, where upskilling is actually probably very good value for money compared with hiring new people who are who have cloud experience as well, um, and definitely recommended as something to consider before you before you go out on a hiring spree and find out you need to get rid of people. Uh, in terms of costs, but um, when you're looking at, so when this equipment becomes end of life, that's when you're targeting to for this for this cloud stuff to be coming online optimally. So some of it's going to happen before others, and you, know, you can retire stuff um, quite op opportunistically uh, and underline licenses and stuff like that as well. Because some of your co some of your costs, your huge costs, might be in licensing with VMware and stuff like that. And then, like you can, you can get those renewals aligned with your with your, your with your cloud kind of maturity, and and make those make that transition line up, and that will make your superiors and your accountants a lot happier. I completely agree. Thank you. Uh, one question for both of you, and actually, since you're both uh, in the the technical line, as it were, um, 
you know, I think the technical people, sometimes we, you know, the business decisions made, but I actually think the technical people have got a lot to contribute, a lot of positive to contribute. So if, if you are a technician in an organization that's a, that is looking to make this journey or even is in the journey and maybe is losing its way a bit, how do you, um, in a, a constructive way, go back to your um, IT director, your C CIO, whoever, and say, you know, here's my view? Um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll take obviously because I'm obviously, you know, a techie and I know, but I think I go back to what I mentioned in my talk. I have had um, long, detailed presentations and attended um, architecture review boards and as an enterprise security architect and done all the slides and the designs and all of those and I've got absolutely nowhere. Um, in my experience, one of the most successful um, migrations I was involved in, um, which uh, I won't name, um, but it's a large retailer, and they actually basically moved their retail operations online into the cloud, literally just before Christmas, which is a, a huge risk for any retailer because mm. Christmas is the biggest sort of revenue stream of the year. But long story short, the reason why that worked was because the um, boss, the big boss, the CIO, he spoke with his team. He was part of the Agile or Scrum team, if you like, on a daily basis. And I'm not saying that's what needs to be done going forward, by the way. But what he did do, he made it very clear to the existing organization that, A, you're keeping your job, but B, this is how we're going to do it, right? This mm -hmm. is going to be done regardless and see here's the designs. So if there's something here you don't like or you think needs to be changed, feel free you guys to, you know, find solutions, ways around. But this is the direction of travel. So this is what it's going to be. So he listened to his team and made, based his decisions accordingly. Oh, absolutely. But I think the key point was he said, we are going into the cloud. So you can put, you either get with, the, with a memo or you can leave, right? Yeah. So I don't want to hear about ifs, buts, maybes. Find solutions because we are going into the cloud. That's it. Okay. I guess for me, it's um, understanding the value add of the cloud, which is when people start talking about DR, BC, resilience, scaling, saying, look, it, it, our current steady state is this, but if we need a, if we want, if we want to be more resilient, we need a DR site, which is going to cost this. Uh, for business continuity purposes, we need to make sure it's in more than one location, et cetera, et cetera. We've got backups to consider, um, you know, the, the, the things that you're not currently spending money on, but you should be, how much, how many of those can you get from a cloud for free? Um, and say, well, okay, we're not, not no longer comparing apples with apples here. You're getting the DR, the BC, the resilience and the, the scaling of the, the like completely on tap kind of infrastructure for free. And, and, and you don't get that from your data center. You might get it from the hybrid approach, but um, I think that's that's another a hybrid. Hybrid is definitely another talk for another day. Um, yeah, that's the next talk we've got you lined up for. Go, going down that route at the moment, which is yeah. interesting. Okay, so let, let's move on to the next question then. Uh, so how do organizations decide what type of workloads are suitable for which type of cloud services, whether it's infrastructure, plat platform, software, and there's, loads of others now of course so how do you how do we make that decision <laughs> so that sort of ties into some of um into some stuff sean has been talking about but certainly um <clears throat> from a very very high level um you know it's a, it's a really good question but um it depends on the organization itself it, there's no one size fits all answer to this question because Various organizations have different um, uh, technology estates. They have different um, technology supporting core business processes, etc. cetera. Um, and it really depends of, on historical architecture. It depends on the strategy of the organization moving forward, how they want to do. It also depends on um, things like regulatory and compliance requirements. So for example, in banking, um, you know, uh, they might have issues with things like encryption. Um, they don't want to, or maybe don't 
trust, you know, the cloud vendor to issue or manage their keys. So that has an impact on whether you're going to use PaaS or SaaS or IaaS. So it's a, <laughs> it's not an easy question to answer. Um, I think from a very high level, um, the reasons why you use as PaaS and SaaS are obvious. However, how you decide or allocate the proportion will depend on the organization. So it really depends on a deep business understanding. Not just the business, but technology. So there's a lot mm. of technology. Uh, uh, there's, there's a reliance on what your existing estate looks like. So, for example, if you're currently using uh, Cloud Foundry or VMware and you know, Sean alluded to your issue of licensing, if you've already paid for those licenses, then does it make sense for you to, to go IaaS? Maybe not. So then you say, okay, maybe we'll just go BAS or SAS for some of our applications. So it's a technology issue, um, but it's not an easy question to just look at because it depends on the organization itself. Yeah, I see there's lots of questions popping up on the, uh, the chat room there, by the way. So, um, you know, if anybody wants to chip in or Dimitri, maybe take a look and see if there's anything you want to address there. And let me just go to the... Uh, the last question we got raised here, I think, how can you get organizations into the transformation mindset needed? And again, I think you've touched on this, but any, uh, any further thoughts as we go through? Um, no, I think, you know, without sort of repeating um, what I've said, I think the mindset, um, it's all about communication. It's about clear communication from the leadership. Uh, make Once a decision is made, um, that decision has to stand. People need to understand that it stands. And really the conversations should be driven about how best we um, would implement or use the cloud technology because that's the direction of travel and for me once you that is clear people come up with a lot of uh, innovative brilliant ideas about how to use the cloud so once you set the you know the, the you set the bar the direction of travel no one can you know that's that's it <laughs> that's the memo go with the memo and you then start from there and move forward Okay. As I so say, if I can I... chip in, yeah, if I can chip in as Francesco, mm. Francesco here, yeah. I think in a lot of transformation that I've seen, IS is infrastructure as a service or lift and shift, so take this service and lift it into the cloud. It's probably the most natural uh, migration path because, uh, as Dimitri has said, teams are used to run server in a certain way and lifting and shifting them in a specific way is probably the easiest and smoother approach. Architecture don't, don't get drastically changed. And then while the maturity of the team get higher and higher, then they can start choosing cloud native service and then move maybe towards more of a, a platform as a service or even uh, software as a service. So things like um, running piece of code directly into uh, service like Lambda and, and things like that and start using uh, um, storage in a different way, uh, different type of storage. But it's, it's, it's all a matter of maturity of the team and getting them comfortably using the service in a clever way and also giving the chance to them to come up with new things. One advantage of using the cloud, for example, that I've seen is giving the developers a very nice and interesting environment where they go and can experiment to actually improve their life. So every day's life, every day experimenting or how to run piece of code, how to run specific service because we have very intelligent people in organization and uh, I think with cloud transformation, some of them get left behind and not used to, um, not, not used as part of the transformation. While the most successful transformation that I've seen is, um, is involving all the part of the organization. Yeah. Like Dimitri was saying, it's like procurement. Uh, what Sean was saying is like part of part of development. Uh, because they can come up with their own version and idea. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Any, uh, any other comments? And I think Paul was challenging on lift and shifting uh, as 
FSH is the perimeter <laughs> issue and problem. Yes, it is. It is the the old idea, and and sometimes it can it can also fail because threats to a cloud environment are very 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 different from uh, an on-prem environment, and you don't get the same level of feeling uh, and the same kind of security control. Uh, that you have on-prem, or if you do, they tend to be clunked in. The old traditional firewall clunked in inside as a front-end to the cloud does not enable a lot of cloud transformation service. And also, um, for example, you don't see a lot of management traffic in the cloud. So if you try to do, um, if you try to force uh, antiquated pattern into the cloud, not only are you making the cloud less secure, but even more complicated and, and you introduce friction. So yes, IaaS uh, lift and shift is probably the, the more traditional approach, but should be taken uh, with a pinch of salt. Yeah, so do you use think, the cloud as cloud. Do you think uh, as organizations mature and as companies mature or, or knowledge, the understanding of cloud matures that people will start to take uh, different approaches then as opposed to just the lift and shift approach yeah i think we will as cloud security alliance we will keep on sharing the knowledge of uh, patents and cloud natives and uh, ideas on on how to migrate uh in, a, in, in this new environment um but that is not new anymore i mean we've been on cloud journey for past almost 10 years now so the cloud rest. is not that new anymore yeah. um but there is still resistance on migrating with uh, full cloud native or getting rid of that firewall and putting, for example, segmentation, virtual private cloud, um, segmenting network in a different way, and using cloud native service like cloud firewall or endpoint firewalls, because those are, if you want, as Dimitri was saying, it, it involves change, change in mindset, change in, in behavior, and it involves also people upskilling, and not everybody wants to do so. Yeah, and if I can, I can add on to Francesco, completely agree with you. I think certainly in my experience, and not in all cases, but in a lot, of, a lot of the time, the reason why there's a lift and shift mentality, certainly when it comes to security architecture, but also solutions architecture, to be fair, is because... Um, a lot of times you have people with uh, who are traditional IT people, um, perhaps don't not very skilled sometimes in the cloud, don't understand how um, the cloud works, uh, software defined networking, or what services are in the cloud. So again, going back to the upskilling and training. Um, aspects of this is that once people understand or you, you train your people make them qualified cloud architects they very quickly understand that the old models you know your perimeterization and all that doesn't work in the cloud you can actually do it a lot easier a lot more effectively more efficiently by under using cloud services and principles and yeah. so in my case i think your answer is um skills a lot of people perhaps don't quite understand how cloud works Thank you. I'm, I'm conscious we, we've hit the top of the hour. In fact, we've run over the top of the hour. So those of you that are still with us, thank you. Um, I have one other question I'd like to ask, but just quickly for the panel, if you're, if you're there, um, can you actually deliver a successful cloud migration in a traditional IT organization? Is digital or agile or both a prerequisite for this? So I'll, I'll pitch in, uh, Vladimir here. Um, so- it's interesting to you know, to see traditional IT organization. You know what it actually is. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you look at the history, and I still remember, uh, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago, uh, when computers were really, really starting, and all the business processes were using paper. You know, the digitization at that time was uh, was seen as a as a godsend. But you know, also some people in the organizations didn't like it because as Dimitri said, you know, it was, it was a change you know, it threatened yeah. their, their jobs. I think cloud is kind of the same, uh, you know, and it has been for last 10 years. So, you know, in the traditional IT organizations, what, what really needs to change is the education of what cloud is first. And, you know, Cloud Security Alliance has a great you know, resources about the guidance, you know, currently in version four, I believe. 
Uh, and what are the kind of design patterns where cloud services, and there are diff different models, uh, could be used and where it perhaps doesn't make sense. Mm. But also, you know, the traditional RT organization uh, I've seen over three years uh, could be a IT manager who thinks that he knows better or she knows better. Um, and uh, the business managers are there to kind of be uh, not at his service, but uh, just use his services. And uh, they should not be really uh, telling him, you know, how to do IT and uh, what needs to be delivered. And those that mindset is not going to change from within the traditional IT organization. It has to change from the above. Uh, it has to be yeah. driven by, by the business, uh, business leaders and business managers. 100% agree with that. 100%. Vlad, yeah. I, I, I yeah. hadn't realized you were that old. Um, you, wouldn't care to <laughs> you, you wouldn't care to introduce yourself, would you? Just quickly. Oh, yes, yes. So I'm um, a security IT professional. Uh, how long? Probably 25 years in, in the business um, of some sort of between IT security, currently running security consultancy um, and helping CSA uh, with their activities. And I think just, just to wrap it up, the, the number of questions, I don't think any, any organization nowadays can avoid digital transformation. And either you do it or you're forced to do it. And we see with the COVID-19 that a lot of organizations were forced to do remote, to test their PCP, uh, their receiving plan, not rely on their own prime environment because maybe there are not, not enough people to maintain. So either the world is gonna push you towards it and you, you jump on board it or not. And also maybe just a, a more softer approach is consider which part of your organization are logically or can logically um, move to the cloud and what other are more logically staying inside in term, you know, on prem in terms of regulation or in terms of, well, maybe it's not very cost effective, maybe changing the architecture will take too much time. So always be rational and consider service by service and you know, move to the cloud. But as a sign overall, digital and digital transformation are necessarily regardless of the size of the organization or, or, or the environment where you operate. Thanks. Um, just lastly, a, a quickie from me, because we're in the middle of this uh, uh, current pandemic or whatever, but there was a discussion going on recently about the difference between disaster recovery and business continuity. And, uh, you know, do we have a, mo a model set up for business continuity, given where we find ourselves? Any quick, uh, quick input from the board on that? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> disaster recovery, you're probably talking about recovery point, recovery time objectives for data or systems. Uh, business continuity, you're probably more concerned about people and processes. Okay. In generally speaking, depends what sort of business though. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, just to, to wrap it all up now, thank you to the panel and especially to Dimitri, uh, Sean, Vladimir and Francesco for their contributions here today. Uh, to Run Lee, who uh, has been organizing it all behind the scenes. Um, just to remind you that uh, we're here for you, uh, delivering mentoring, research, events, networking, and uh, you can find our Twitter handle and our LinkedIn group listed uh, below. And uh, the last point here is around Cybersecurity Awards 2020. Um, there's need to get your submission in by the 10th of May, and uh, the ceremony is the 4th of July, I should bring fireworks, of course. And, um, you know, all things being equal, of course, at the moment. And this is where you can log your, uh, your vote. So I don't know if anybody on the board has anything more to add to the discussion or whether I yeah, should maybe, wrap it up at this point. Maybe, maybe just to mention that these are what probably is going to go digital and you should be putting your, um, your submission uh, and your candidate so if you, if you feel yourself as a candidate for, uh, as an influencer or somebody can add some contribution, don't shout out to put forward your name 
uh, and you can self-candidate yourself. We're going to put forward some names as well, uh, but don't shy out and please feel free to candidate yourself and vote and upload. The judge will will definitely have the last say uh, in who, who this, this person or, or the person of the year will be, but please feel free to um, put yourself forward, put yourself out there. Look forward to seeing some of those nominations then. Thanks, Francesco. So thanks again, Dimitri, Sean, uh, Vladimir, uh, Run Lee, uh, Lee, if you're still on, and the other members of the board. Uh, ben, I think you're out there as well. I hope you're feeling um, a little bit better, Ben, uh, and um, able to follow the conversation. You were certainly active on the chat room. So thanks, everyone, and uh, speak to you again soon. Don't forget, this is going to be up on our website as a recording with all the comments and notes going along with it. Take care, everybody, and um, do avoid that nasty bug that's going around at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.